Well, good evening, everybody. Very pleased indeed to have uh, the panelists here. Uh, just a quick introduction <coughs> from me before we get things going. Um, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to be supporting Columbia Entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is John Walker. Uh, I'm with a company called Temp CFO. Um, I'm a professor at the Columbia Business School. I graduated from Columbia Business School, so uh, it's a, blue is in my blood for definite. Um, and uh, we've been around, so our company is, uh, we do accounting and CFO services for startups. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we take you from Series Seed all the way through to uh, major exit. Pinterest, Slack, and Stripe have been clients of ours on the West Coast, and I manage the East Coast. So if you ever have anybody here has any questions or, 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 or are curious about what it means to be running finance in a startup, come and, come and ask me. I'm more than happy to talk about it. Um, I think tonight's topic, uh, obviously, Steve, is uh, uh, fantastic to have our panelists here. Um, the topic of defense, actually, is personally interesting because I spent the first 10 years of my career in the defense industry. And so I think remembering back to those days, which are, God forbid, 20 years ago now, um, gets longer and longer, uh, remembering those, those situations where massive project times and all the ops license we were dealing with, all the complexity of those systems, I think talking now about some of the, the, the ways that we can bring new techniques to it is, uh, is particularly uh, interesting and exciting. But in any case, um, I'm going to ha hand over, and we're obviously very, very um, honored to have Justin uh, Fox here tonight as our, as our moderator, who is a columnist for uh, Bloomberg uh, View, uh, has been an editor of, uh, of Harvard Business Review before. Um, my, my wife is a Harvard grad, so I, I have the displeasure of receiving Harvard Business Review at the uh, <laughs> At the department, I try to make sure the Columbia Business Review sits on top of it on the uh, coffee table. Um, but you're also a, an award-winning author and journalist for Time, Fortune, and, and many other uh, many other publications. So, uh, all of you, thank you very much indeed. And Justin, I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much, John. Um, so, our topic today, I think, if I'm remembering the title correctly, is hacking for defense and diplomacy. And that happens to be the name of some classes that Steve. Blank is going to tell us about um, in a bit. But I also think the broader question, and the reason we have a bunch of people here, we have a reel here, is to also just sort of more broadly discuss the issue of how entrepreneurial people, entrepreneurial ideas, new technologies, different ways of thinking um, can fruitfully interact with the national security establishment and public service in general. And, and so I want to, one thing I want to start out with just as a question, how many people out here and up here have worked in a government job before? I know you have, okay. How many of you hope to do so in the future? How many of you would like to contribute somehow or other beyond just paying your taxes to the security, prosperity, and decency of your nation? That's a trick. That's a trick question, isn't it? That's... <laughs> Are you grading this at the end? Is that... No, I just sort of, I'm curious, because that beginning part, and I thought it would come out that way. It's like not that many people are itching to uh, join up, I guess. And, and so um, you, I assume everybody has full biographies of these people, but this is of real hands. That's Steve Blank over there. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple of quick little biographical questions. Um, and I guess the first one is that Avril, most recently before coming to Columbia, was the deputy national security advisor. Before that, she was deputy director of the CIA. But she actually was an entrepreneur at some point, early in her career, um, ran a Coffee shop, cafe, bookstore? What, what, how do you describe it? Bookstore, cafe, yeah. And this was right out of college? It's clearly the most interesting thing that I've done, by the way. That is <laughs> well, no, it's, 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 I mean, that's partly it. And you were like, I, I'm sorry, I did lots of reading. And no, your banker was pushing you to start a, you know, turn it into a chain. Was uh, that true? or? It, well, yeah. When you think that when we started it, um, uh, it was basically me charging up all of my credit cards in order to get it started. And then after the first year, we sort of made the case to the bank that allowed them to give us a loan. And then over the, um, over the course of a few more years, as the business grew, essentially the bank did come back to us. We had a, a loan officer that took a special interest in us and uh, essentially said, 
do you want to expand? Do you want to open up more stores? And that's when I had a moment where I sort of, frankly, took a weekend off and went away by myself and tried to figure out what on earth I wanted to do with my life and decided that uh, as much as I loved bookstores, and that was really a big part of the motivation of opening up a bookstore cafe, it turns out that when you have a bookstore cafe, you're still focused on the bottom line and you're still thinking about it as a business and it takes an enormous amount of work. And I decided that what I was really enjoying at the time was the community work I'd gotten involved in. And so I decided to take a shift, basically, in terms of selling the business while it was still doing well, which turned out to be a good thing because it paid for law school, and going to law school and, and trying something totally different. And then the fact that that then led you into the State Department and then um, the CIA and elsewhere was that in anywhere in the back of your head, or did that just kind of? No, I, I am the poster child for the fact that anybody can have a career in government. I, I started <laughs> off, I really am like, I started off in physics, that was my major, and that's what, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I sort of thought I would do, and what I would spend my life in. And, and I loved it, I love science, and I got distracted with the bookstore thinking, Basically, I could do the bookstore and do my PhD in physics at the same time, and you know, which was completely naive, right? So I ended up taking a leave of absence, and then I ended up doing law school. And when I was at law school, I ended up spending a summer at the State Department, and I loved it. I loved the people, I loved the work, I found it fascinating, and I decided this would be really fun. And uh, and so, you know, spent a year in an international organization, did a clerkship, and then went to government. And, uh, and things really developed. And one of the things, at least in my career path, that um, I share with a lot of the colleagues that I've had over the years is that being open to opportunities has been a big part of what has made us all successful, I think, which is to say that you know, I certainly could not have predicted the path that I took. And in fact, with the agency job, I resisted it, um, thinking this was not the right move. And, uh, pushed back for a while, and then you know I ended up doing it, and I ended up loving it, and really learning a tremendous amount. So it's um, it's just been one thing after another, and there's so many different factors that come into it. But I've I've loved the work, I've loved the people, and I found those two things to be utterly critical to my job happiness. So um, and actually, I'd probably put the people above the type of work in terms of my job happiness. I found that uh, you know if you don't like the people that you're going to go to work with essentially every day. You really don't want to get up in the morning and do it. So it's, um, but it's been an incredible experience for me. So Steve, you're the entrepreneur guy, but before you were an entrepreneur, you were in the military, right? Yes. What did you do? Uh, so uh, I ended up uh, volunteering for the Air Force during Vietnam and spent a year and a half in Southeast Asia learning electronics is how I ended up in Silicon Valley, electronic intelligence, electronic warfare. And when I got out, uh, long story, but ended up uh, in the Valley in the mid-1970s when we were still selling um, equipment to other businesses. There was no consumer <coughs> electronics business. And also there was a very strong component of uh, defense in Silicon Valley at the time, and still is. Uh, Lockheed was the largest employer, uh, made our, all our submarine launch <laughs> ballistic missiles and built our first and second generation of uh, intelligence gathering satellites. And I worked for a startup run by someone named Bill Perry, who was a PhD mathematician, but uh, uh, ended up eventually as a Secretary of Defense. And so my introduction to the Valley was through what I would call a halfway house between startups and, and the military. The, the one thing you said, you volunteered during Vietnam. Yeah. Not a lot of, was this, so you wouldn't get drafted to go do something worse, or were you just masochistic? Or what? So, actually, you know, there's a, if anybody's been in the military, you know the number one rule is never volunteer for anything. And actually, my entire career in life has been in violation of that rule. I have volunteered for everything. And I found as an entrepreneur that 80% of the game is showing up more than anybody else. Um, and, and so, you know, when, in fact, I got stationed in my first base just outside of Miami. It was the cushiest base in the Air Force. And someone came into the shop literally the first week before I ever got to touch an airplane. And anybody, they said, anybody want to go to the war zone? And I raised my hand. Um, and the rest of my career has been like that, is I tended to pick for startups the, you know, the most toughest technical challenges 
that were also, people thought were incredibly outnumbered by competitors or surrounded and whatever. And I found those incredibly fascinating because number one, people never thought you had any odds of succeeding and if you did, it was considered a miracle win and B, you got um, incredible opportunity both in learning technology but in doing things that no one else would think you were capable of doing. So I did eight startups, two microprocessor startups, supercomputers, enterprise software, video games, et cetera. Um, and the only common theme was attention deficit disorder. Um, so to bring things to our, our title here, you, you then, after your eight startups, started teaching your lean startup ideas at Berkeley originally, or what? First at Berkeley in, in the business school, then at Stanford in the engineering <coughs> school. And, uh, and, and obviously after I was tired of second tier schools, I got invited to teach here at Columbia. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, <laughs> and the- uh, The first applause line. Yeah, like, thank yeah. you. Um, Always pander to the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the big idea for how many of you are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? Or, so in the 20th century, I'm going to tell you some old man history and very quickly. In the 20th century, investors essentially treated startups as smaller versions of large companies. It's a big idea. There was no differentiation between what investors were telling startups to do than they would have told a large company to do. That, that is, they were telling you the way you succeeded is you wrote a 40-page business plan you know, with what the team, here's the opportunity, and more importantly, you had a, you know, Appendix A, which was the forecast with a five-year plan, which every number pointed to $100 million of revenue in year five. In fact, I used to tell my students there was a secret Excel key code to auto-generate that, and there, some of them are still looking for the, those keys. Uh, the point is, is that people assumed that startups were not only smaller versions of companies, that all you had to do was execute, execute the plan you just wrote. No one actually acknowledged that no business plan for a startup survived first contact with customers. That is, it was a document you wrote to get funded, you threw it in a drawer, and then you did something very different. And the insight that started the entire lean startup methodology and revolution was pretty simple. Large companies were executing known business models. They knew their customers, they knew their competitors, they knew pricing, they were large because they had discovered all this. But startups, startups didn't know very much. Actually, startups were dealing with a series of unknowns. Startups were actually searching for business models. And this distinction between search and ex execution had never been articulated before. I mean, people kind of knew it, but, but people didn't quite say, wait a minute, the emperor has no clothes, you're making us do something that has no relevance here. And the reason why no one wanted to say that is we didn't actually know what it was you were supposed to be doing. And so my contribution was one, having that insight, and then two, realizing that startups needing, needed their own management stack. We had built 100 years of management tools for execution, but very little methodology for searching for business models. And the Lean Startup was just the summary of my work in customer discovery, Alexander Osterwalder's work, in developing something called the Business Model Canvas and Eric Reese's work in realizing that agile engineering was the, was the way you could implement incrementally and iteratively. And some things fell out, things called minimum viable products and this notion of a pivot. And, and what it allowed us to do is have a kind of set of heuristics or a, a set of rules for startups on how to think about building companies. And to make a very long story short, it kind of swept the startup world in the beginning of the 21st century and then your old magazine, the HBR, put it on the cover of 2013, which gave permission to large companies because it said on the cover of HBR why the lean startup changes everything. And that happened to be the time that large companies were now dealing with continuous disruption. It's not like they weren't being disrupted and didn't know about it in the 20th century. Clayton Christensen and others and Rita McGrath here had been writing about it. But for the first time, they were dealing with disruption that was occurring continuously and for the first time, large companies were looking to startups for methodologies. And so in the last five years, uh, large corporations have been starting to adopt it. And the segue to our conversation is, gee, governments are waking up and thinking about crisis or now no, we no longer have 18 months between crises, we have about 18 minutes between crises. And so the methodologies we, we built in the 20th century to just deal with the Soviet Union and one main adversary, you need a scorecard of the day to figure out who we're dealing with. And so people are now starting to look 
to lean as the same potential set of methodologies for government. That's well, the end yeah. of the soliloquy. Well, and so one question, and this is for both of you really, is that, but these governmental organizations, I mean, aircraft carriers are still aircraft carriers. There, there are still large organizations and large entities that need to execute. How does that fit together? And I'm like, but can I, yeah, I'll start and then Steve should finish. But I, I thoroughly agree with everything that he's just said. And one of the oh, things Oh, good, we that, could go now. That's right, exactly, we're done. The, um, but, but particularly in the national security world, at least, I would say we are consistently facing more threats. They're happening more quickly, like the generation cycle is faster, in a sense. And they're more complex in the sense that you typically need greater um, and diverse expertise to really understand them and deal with them on a pretty consistent basis. And in a way, that has led us to a situation where consistent innovation is actually critical to dealing with national security issues. And fully agree that you, know, you still need to execute in some respects, but you also need an innovation culture in a way to deal with the things that are occurring on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the two can coexist in a sense. And it's a, um, but I, I, that would be my sort of framing for you. But Steve, no, I, you I completely agree. And what's really interesting, it's the same thing that's happening to large companies. And what's, what's interesting is that large companies, I mean, think about retail today in the United States being, being literally taken apart by Amazon. Um, you know, how do you deal with continuous disruption by transforming the core of an execution agency that, or, 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 or organization that was doing retail for 100 years into something very different. Um, some form of retail will continue to exist, but it won't look anything like today. Um, the, the problem I observed, and the reason why I'm kind of interested in government, is we could afford to have Macy's go out of business. We can't afford to have our intelligence community go out of business. It's a big idea. Disruption happens equally to both, but, but one part of the country cannot survive, or at least survive in the way it is, if we are disrupted by a set of surprises that make us no longer the leader in a set of areas that we normally used to lead. And, and you know, I think it's pretty public that people who used to be near-peer competitors are no longer near-peers. Um, and that requires innovation that may be a different cycle speed than we've been doing, and, and this may be some way to contribute to doing that. Does that make sense? Or, I mean, I'm, me. I, I've been yeah. pretty oblique, but. I, right. Uh, yeah. Well, so then this, these specific hacking classes, where was the first one? How did it so, so one of the things that happened, and, and I'll just give the audience a little background, is so this lean methodology, geez, people are starting to do it. It's now the beginning of the 21st century. Silicon Valley entrepreneurs at least use the language. Everybody uses pivot. Eric Reese is kind of the Johnny Appleseed of you know, telling the story. <coughs> Alexander Osterwalder, business model generation book, sells millions of copies. Um, but there was still no class. There was, in fact, the capstone class in any university up to 2011, even though we were kind of believing in this lean stuff, was still how to write a business plan in any entrepreneurship, in business school, in engineering school. And, and I knew that was wrong. I just didn't know what to do about it. And, and in 2011, I put together a radically new class called the Lean Launchpad, which said, let's take these components, business model design, customer development, agile engineering, set up the class as teams would come in with their ideas, and every week we'll teach them some part of a business model, what's a customer, what's a channel, what's pricing, but we will force them to get out of the building and talk to 10 to 15 customers a week and every week build a new minimum viable product. Every week. And by the time you're done with the class, you've talked to over 100 customers and partners or regulators and whatever, and you've built multiple cycles of minimum viable products. Because it was such a radical class, um, I decided to share it by blogging every week of the class. Here were my slides, here are the students' slides, here's what worked, here's what didn't. What I didn't realize is back in Washington, D.C., the head of commercialization of the National Science Foundation, Errol Arkelik, was reading every week as kind of a serial novel. Class ends, he calls me up and says, hi, the U.S. government needs your help. We've been running the SBIR program for 30 years. Thank God Congress hasn't asked how well we're doing, or else we'd all be in jail. What's SBIR? Uh, the SBIR program basically is, about 30 years ago, Congress said, that since we're funding basic science in the United States, 
We want every federal research agency to reserve, today it's approximately 3% of their research budget for commercialization. Anybody who's gotten a basic science grant can go raise their hand and apply for free money. Half, half a million to two million dollars, depending whether it's NSF or NIH or anything else. Um, and they gave out these grants. The problem is they didn't give any instructions with the grants. So you were giving scientists commercialization money and not, and not teaching them anything about how to build a company. And so what the NSF decided, and, and in fact they were lying to me on the phone, is we think you invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship. Okay, you got my attention now. And so make a long story short, National Science Foundation adopted this lean launchpad, lean methodology class as the basis of commercialization of science. It got written into federal legislation. It's now taught in 86 universities. We've put 1,500 teams of our best scientists and engineers through this class in the last six years. Now, to answer your question about hacking for defense. This class was about taking scientists and their ideas through this methodology. It worked pretty well. NSF liked it. I prototyped the class for, uh, at UCSF for life sciences, for therapeutics, devices, diagnostics, digital health. NIH adopted it. Then DHS adopted it. Then the White House and OSTP said, why don't we have all the federal research agencies have some version of it. DOE adopted it. But it was still serving specific ideas of engineers. And the more I st start thinking about the challenges our country had, and also I had a personal view that we've run a 40-year science experiment of disconnecting our students from any skin in the game of national service, I, I thought there might be some way this class can contribute to the safety and security of the country. And so I partnered with uh, two ex-colonels, one uh, Pete Newell, who used to run the Army's Rapid Equipping Force, and Joe Felter, who was teaching at, uh, at Stanford, uh, ex-Special Forces, and uh, we decided to go out to the DOD and intelligence community and see if we could use the same class, same methodology, get out of the building, talk to customers, but instead of students working on their problems, could we actually get problems from the U.S. government, real problems, whether they were from SOCOM or CIA or NSA or different parts of the DOD, and have them deliver real solutions at the end of 10 weeks. Um, and there were two hypotheses that we had no idea whether they would be true. One is, would any students want to get engaged in real government problems? And two is, could we get problems that were serious and real scrubbed down to an unclassified level that could be used not only by students but by foreign nationals? Because at Stanford, you could not exclude people from the class. And so we ran a prototype for what was called Hacking for Defense uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, sitting in that class was a representative of the State Department who by week three, Svika Krieger realized the State Department needs a version of this. And 90 days later, we were not only teaching Hacking for Defense, we were working with State and teaching Hacking for Diplomacy, solving um, refugee problems and, and problems in embassies. And the class actually became successful in scale. It's now taught at 10 or 11 universities. It just got written into the National Defense Authorization Act um, as a standard part of uh, uh, the DOD, and uh, hopefully it'll scale to multiple universities and multiple agencies. So that's the long-winded version of what's hacking for defense. So. And I'll just say, if it's all right. Yeah, please. Justin, it, there are a lot of other um, programs and efforts to do kind of innovation within the U.S. government, mm -hmm. it, you know, that are, are similar to and, you know, intersect in different ways that Steve knows about and others. But, for example, one thing that um, uh, President Obama started was something called the U.S. Digital Service, yep. which I gather is going to continue um, in this administration or, or has at least thus far. And the number, basically we had teams that went out to different agencies. Mm -hmm. And these were folks that were brought in under a particular program that had expertise in both innovation and in technology. And, uh, and they worked on whatever it was that the agency needed work on. And they were in the you know, version that was allowed to be classified, basically. And they did just a really, an extraordinary range of things. They worked on things, uh, for example, in the context of law enforcement, where there were questions about whether or not you could identify uh, what is likely to be, for example, child pornography on the internet, where you're dealing with um, uh, potential predators 
who are looking for it, can you come up with a way to spot it so that then agents can focus in on the right place where they need to focus in order to spot as many as they can. Um, you know, there were things uh, dealing with import and export efforts. There was uh, also with the refugee program, they helped at the State Department in um, streamlining some of the processes that were dealt with also for just immigration more generally. It was just a slew of things that you wouldn't even necessarily think of, but from all different parts of the government where people started to realize the advantage of having you know, folks come in with that kind of expertise and knowledge for a period of time and, and really kind of do a sprint team almost in a sense um, on particular issues. And then you sort of have different versions of this throughout. But one of the things that Steve and I have talked about is that in many respects, you know, people find ways to solve problems to address the mission that they're addressing. And they do it in different ways within agencies based on the particular culture or you know, challenges that they're facing and so on. And it's hard, uh, but clearly necessary on some level to have an opportunity to look across those ways and think about what's the most effective way to do this. Are there repeatable uh, versions of this that can be done in other agencies and so on? And I think one of the geniuses of you know, the, the sort of model that's been set out by Steve is that it sort of identifies, here is the process. Here's a sort of a best a practice. A process. Gone. Exactly. A right? process. And you can use this process, and it's one that's been tested in a variety of different ways, and you can adapt it to the yeah. particular uh, scenario that you have. But it's a way to really focus people on this is a process for doing this that's actually pretty effective. And it's a, you know, a challenge that we've all got to meet, but there are so many fascinating ways yeah. you can improve. And, and it's worth it. You reminded me in, in our conversation earlier, you know, for those of you who don't know, the, the government actually has kind of been a leader historically in innovation. Um, people who funded innovation at Stanford post-World War II was ONR, Office of Naval Research, actually was kind of the, after World War II, basically the only government agency that was funding advanced technology until the Korean War. And, and then uh, during Sputnik, we stood up DARPA uh, to actually accelerate long-term innovation and actually got some interesting things out of that. And then about 10 or 15 years ago, Gilman Louie and others uh, stood up Incutel to try to take the venture capital world and, and kind of try to integrate it in first the intelligence community and now the rest of the DOD. And so if you really think about it, this lean methodology is just one more thing that we're trying to apply from both the outside world and adapt it to innovation, not only U.S. digital service, but people like Sue Gordon and NGA and TechFAR and being able to do kind of um, agile contracting. <laughs> and the uh, current Defense Authorization Act has other components of innovation. You know, people get the idea that the government doesn't innovate. I just say the government is not the leader often in, 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 in innovation process, but over time, certainly in the last administration, it made some serious efforts to kind of adapt best practices from Silicon Valley and others, and I think they did a pretty good job. Uh, we're still buying aircraft carriers the same way, by right. the way, um, <coughs> which yeah. is a different discussion we're we had, right? Yes. Well, it's, 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 by the way, the, the yeah. question isn't, you know, are we still buying them the, the right way? The question is, why are we still buying aircraft carriers, right? That's a, that's a different discussion and a much harder one to have because if you're a, this is my opinion, if, if your whole career is to be a, Admiral who's in charge of a you know, carrier strike group, the last thing you're gonna say is perhaps we ought to think about some other place to spend that $13 billion. That's the last conversation you're gonna have because your career is focused on that. Well, and I mean, that is like in the military and I would assume, I, you know, the CIA, I think most of us know less about it, but it seems like it's mostly people who are spending their whole careers there, right? Or not? So there's definitely um, a lot of people who do spend, if not their whole careers, most of their career uh, in these institutions. Um, and one of the things that I think you know, it has been one of the challenges, particularly in the technology area, right, has been actually getting people to come in mid-career, finding an opportunity for them to do it in a way that makes sense for their career. Um, attracting them, setting up a process for hiring them, doing all of those things, and those have required exceptions, and that's one of the things that we've done, uh, that, or that we did um, during the Obama administration, was trying to, to find ways to do that. I, I don't think that's necessarily bad, and it, I, but here's um, one way of thinking about this problem, you know, and to, for obviously folks to react to and think about it. I, 
there's sort of tactical innovation in a way. You know, the, what you need to get the mission done. Can I do it better? Can I, you know, um, get more out of X? Can I adjust myself because, the, you know, the adversary has adjusted and I need to respond or um, get better in a sense. And then there's kind of strategic innovation in a way, and that's much harder. And I think that's much harder, frankly, you know, regardless of where you are, it's not easy to, to really rethink the framework that you're currently operating under. And, uh, and some of the problem, I think, with that is because you have folks who have lived and become institutionalized and, you know, are attached to what they're doing. And one of the ways that we would try to deal with that in the context of uh, the agency, at least, and then within the intelligence community more generally, is doing red cells, people who, who really step out of uh, the roles who are institutionally out of um, the sort of chain of command who are... Uh, separated uh, um, for years, not somebody who's just stepping out for a short period, um, but and who actually provides sort of like under different assumptions analysis that would go one way or the other. Um, but you also, I think, have a challenge even separate from that, which is just really rethinking your policy and, and the way in which you frame things. I, and I don't, you know, when I... Um, it just as an example to give you a sense of what I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I've been working recently on uh, a project relating to access to energy, right? And most countries around the world uh, privatized, you know, energy uh, resource extraction because it was the way to get substantial capital to do the extraction that was necessary to pull resources out of the earth um, in order to provide the energy, right? And that was sort of the most effective way to do it. Now, with the low cost of renewables occurring and a variety of other shifts in, in the landscape, you know, one of the questions that is starting to burble up is, are we, should we be thinking about this in a whole different way? Should we be thinking about the energy framework more along the lines of the way we think about highways and you know, public infrastructure, in, in a sense? And is that a better model? And it's just, you know, for, for you to make a shift like that in a government is very hard. You've sort of worked, everything is, aligned to a particular um, incentive and structure and you're working within it and to really try to make that shift is very tough. And that's something that I think we, I continually struggle with, um, but I think it's you know, just a, a constant issue that we face. And I don't know that any of the things we've talked about really solve it, but it is something to continually sort of at least be aware of and question and create that sort of nonconformist thinking for a little bit while you're, you know, I mean, because that's true. Issues. It's not just it's any organization that's totally. been doing something a certain way for yeah. a long time. I would imagine Columbia University has certain things that it does. And, that... and, and you know, the, probably the best example in the commercial world of, of a company that pulled that off was we kind of forget nowadays that Apple used to be a desktop computer company. Um, that, that's only about 10% of their business and today. Right. Um, you know, one guy said, you know, we're going to die doing this and then did the iPhone and the iPad and got them into the music business and the application business and, you know, some of it on, on, with a clear vision, some of it kind of stumbling into the app store and, and whatever, but, but he basically fired and shot his current business. I mean, that model is they burned the boats at, on the beach. There was no going back. Um, and that's really hard and sometimes takes a visionary leader that kind of controls all the movement here. I mean, you're talking about privatizing uh, electricity. I mean, there are a whole set of incumbents who might have a different opinion, even though there might be a leader uh, who says go that way. Um, you know, I think that and it's maybe worth discussing here for innovation. We had a set of what were called offset strategies, right? Now, yeah. uh, the first one was using tactical nuclear weapons under Eisenhower and their new look, and then Bill Perry and, and uh, the second offset strategy using stealth and, and semiconductors and software to... Uh, Why was it called an offset strategy? Uh, so so the, let's take the one in the middle of the Cold War with the Soviet Union and, and stop me if I get this no, wrong, is that no. the Soviets had, in, in Europe had built a, almost a two to three to one advantage in tanks and artillery and manpower facing NATO. And the only way you would just do the math going, I guess we need to match them. And, but politically, that was just unfeasible. We didn't have the draft anymore, and that would just would have you know, started an arms race in conventional weapons, or else we would have had it say, we'll do first use of tactical nukes, and no one wanted to go there. 
But Bill Perry, who was the, uh, back then the head of uh, research and development for, for the Department of Defense, said for the first time we have a technology advantage in semiconductors and software that the Soviet Union did not have. And we could turn that into a set of weapons that they can't match to actually break um, their conventional weapon lead. And it turned into stealth. It turned into what, what was called ISR. Um, and it turned into precision guided weapons. So now all of a sudden, one missile or one shell took out one tank instead of you know, having to do carpet bombing. And, and all of a sudden, the Soviets didn't have that kind of technology capability, and they couldn't match this. Um, does that make sense? And, yeah, yeah. and that was called an offset strategy. By the way, as an aside, um, we decided to do the same for ICBMs, called it Star Wars, and we didn't even believe it, but they believed it. Um, and, and, and so kind of panicked them, even though it was, that, that one really wasn't an offset strategy. And now we're, we've been searching for the third offset strategy of thinking about maybe it's AI or machine intelligence or, or robotics or something else to think about the offsets of all these other competitors. Did I get that right? Yeah, no, I think that's um, right. And, and so we've been looking for what's been called the third offset strategy for military. I personally have a belief that the third offset strategy is not just technology, but our speed of innovation, and that we really haven't re recognized that that is what our culture does well, and that at least China has figured out how to innovate at speed as well as we do, and unless we understand that, we might be out-innovated, not just on technology, but of speed of innovation and adaptation, is if you look at basically how quickly they've adapted technologies in, into their, certainly their Navy and, and, and um, um, anti-access technologies are pretty spectacular. Um, I mean, really spectacular. Yeah, just to follow up on that, if that's very interesting. I, one of the things that Some we, of you actually know something is going to follow no, no, up no, on no, that. No, 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 I didn't. That's not true. The, um, one of the things, one of the paradigms that we continually seem to face was uh, this concept of asymmetric threats between the United States and adversaries. And, and normally when people talk about asymmetric threats, they talk about non-state actors, which is its own concern. But in this context, just to, to play off of what you said, I think if you focus on state actor asymmetric threats, here's a way to, to think about that particular paradigm. Um, it would be places where the United States has a high value asset Right, that can be held at risk by an adversary at relatively low cost to that adversary right, in a non-conventionally escalatory way. And in many ways, this scenario paints itself out in a variety of different fields where you see how the adversary is using innovation, basically, to promote a threat towards us. Right? So cyber is a perfect example of this. It's asymmetric in the sense that um, so much of uh, cyber infrastructure is owned and operated essentially out of the United States, right? It is something that we rely on more than the vast majority of countries. Um, it is about 85%, I believe is what the DHS figure was, uh, owned privately as opposed to publicly, which is fine except that it makes it more complex for the government to set uniform standards for security and other things along those lines for the cyberspace. And uh, you know, it is one that we rely on, for example, our private sector relies heavily, obviously, on cyber. We also have digital assets, all of these other things develop. These are things that make our country strong in many respects, is wealth producing and valuable, um, high value asset, but we're uniquely vulnerable in many respects as well. I mean, when you look at utilities, for example, I think it's uh, now over 50% of households are actually um, have a smart meter. Right, attach their electricity piece, which means that it's possible to attack it through a cyber um, mechanism. So the, the reality, so this is a high value asset. It's relatively low cost for adversaries that are interested in attacking our cyber infrastructure to do so, when you think about it, right? And they can do it in a non-conventionally escalatory way, which means that it, it's, um, they can attack without necessarily uh, sort of, um, going beyond a line that internationally is accepted as a basis for a response. And so it's actually very hard for us to figure out 
How do we respond in a way that our allies, our partners will agree is an appropriate response? How do we deal with it in that scenario? Other examples of this though are in space. Our energy is another place where you see this, migration, even all of these different places. But it's ways where you can see how um, basically an adversary looks for you know, places where they can innovate and find ways to hold at risk a relatively low cost to them, things that are of value to us. And similarly, we need to innovate in order to think through how we can respond without actually hurting the great value that all of these you know, areas bring to the United States. And, and so if you really think about what you just said is people are now playing offset strategies against, against us. us. So the, the Cold War offset strategy was precision guided weapons and stealth against an entire you know, conventional weapon systems. It was a cheap hack, now relatively cheap hack, which negated their entire thousands of tanks. Here, people are using uh, potential asymmetric software threats to do the same thing. Yeah. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And so this is why innovation in government for safety and security of the country is kind of important, is we need to continually innovate to not only match these threats, but to come up with ours. Um, and. Um, um, it, it's a continual game. And it requires, uh, you know, my view, um, a, a different type of thinking than we used to have. We just need to be operating at continuous innovation speed, much like startups do. I mean, startups have been doing this 24 7. The conversation we had also is that, uh, you know, people sometimes say, is how come the Department of Defense can't innovate like startups? But in the battlefield, <laughs> they innovate better than startups. It's just that when they get back home, they collapse down into bureaucracy. And as you pointed out, there's some things in the battlefield you don't want to do back home. But it's not like the military doesn't know how to do this. It's, mm -hmm. it's just that the infrastructure in the bureaucracy kind of like collapses it back into execution. Um, <coughs> one question as we're talking about, it, clearly like during the Obama administration, there was a great interest in Silicon Valley, love for Silicon Valley, I don't know what. Now, part, partly purely political, there's a new administration, a guy who was not supported by all but a handful of Silicon Valley people, so there's this sort of turning against it there, but there's this broader societal, maybe less against the startups than against Google and Amazon and all, but at some level there's this suspicion now among a lot of people of this whole world that Silicon Valley has created. And I, I don't know what, where to go with that exactly, but it just seems like that, that has been this shift going on. Do you think it's gonna shift back? Or is there something gonna have to change about the way um, the technology world relates with the rest of us and with government? I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. so uh, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while and uh, this is completely an uneducated opinion other than as an observer. I think we confuse large corporations whose names happen to be Google, Facebook, Apple, et cetera, with Silicon Valley startups. These companies have nothing to do with startups anymore. They are just as big as GM or, or you know, name of large corporations. What's worse is the ones that deal with social media are actually you know, delivering a version of Oxycontin you know, I mean, they're, they're peddling dopamine, um, you know, modifiers in a way that is completely unregulated and it's fine for them. You're making me want to check my phone. Yeah, well, you're right. That, that's the point. And, the, you know, the point is not only for adults, the point is their effect for kids. Um, and, and so that's different from how do we deal with startups and innovation. They just happen to be tech companies, but we... You know, AT&T and, and Verizon are not startups. They're technology companies that happen to own, you know, network asset, assets. And we were arguing about net, net neutrality is, you know, which big organization do we want to win? It's, it wasn't about startups. Um, so I think this, there needs to be some differentiation about, you know, large corporations who happen to be technology suppliers versus startups that have a technology ecosystem going on. I don't know if that made any sense. Um, there is something else going on in Silicon Valley about technology innovation that should be kind of both scary and worth thinking about. Um, in the 20th century, uh, venture capital funded things that were in the national interest. They funded computers, they funded life sciences, etc. I'll contend that in the 21st century, 
venture capital and national interest have literally diverged. Um, you could make an argument that life sciences is still being funded in, in our interest. I, I'm not sure you could make the same argument that those tens of billions of dollars going into social media actually is the right place for investment if you had a national investment policy of where we wanted money to go. But that conversation is a third rail in the United States. You can't talk about a national technology policy without people starting to vibrate. Um, and, and, and should we be talking about one? I mean, or should we all vibrate? Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I don't disagree with these points. I wonder, though, and I'm not sure I fully understand um, the public view and its, you know, um, view of Silicon Valley per se, but it does seem to me as if a piece of this is actually also inequality related. I mean, and I don't, it, to my mind, um, so separate from and not taking mm -hmm. away from what Steve just said, I, um, we're seeing increasing gap of uh, both income and wealth in the United States and in um, wealthier countries, it's uh, increasing at a pretty remarkable rate. And I think, you know, what it has been since the 1980s, about a 10% increase in the gap uh, along, across all OECD countries and uh, the state of the United States has been at a, a, a higher rate than that, than the average. And then, I saw a recent statistic that said 84.6% um, of the world's wealth is in 8.1% of the world's population, um, which is a pretty remarkable figure when you think about it. And I do think that's at least a piece of what's happening. And it, it's not- So I'm we're not in a new gilded age. Or, yeah, but it is, yeah. I mean, I think there's a real, um, there's a real problem there, and I think that's a part of at least the perception of the Silicon Valley piece. Um, it's an odd place. Well, it's yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're not having a big Q&A session after here because there's basically a cocktail party afterwards. But we're going to do a. We're going to have time for a couple of questions now. If anybody wants to, there's a mic over here. You're only going to take the best questions. Here's Isn't that somebody right? Somebody up in the. And if you could introduce yourself, just because that makes it more fun. Hi, um, my name is Asif. So Avril, um, Steve, and Justin. It was a very entertaining, entertaining uh, conversation here. Really enjoyed it. Um, like you, Steve, I was in the Air Force for 10 years. Um, and you know, more I served, more I saw things like human trafficking in South Korea and um, you know, separating a insurgent from his family by arresting him in Afghanistan, um, I really started thinking that, you know, pen is mightier than the sword. I uh, started believing in that. So I'm in the transition of Korea right now. As you said, I really said, um, you know, keep an open mind for opportunities. Um, my question to you is, um, what are some of the steps you took during that career that you're about to leave to jump into the something I would call a beast, I guess. Like you just call it, say it again. To jump into the next career. Like yeah. what are some of the steps that you took to um, build yourself up for the next career? Because like you definitely left a business that you actually built for yourself and enjoyed it, but you took a big chance. And I'm trying to do the same thing. Uh, yeah. And I hope this helps other people as well uh, in the future. Um, what are some of the steps you took to um, you know, take that jump, I would say, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I, when I shifted from science to the bookstore, I'll tell you, my, my, um, my father called my then boyfriend, who's now my husband, so it lasted, but, um, <laughs> and said, uh, you can't let her do this. You can't let her leave physics. She's only good at physics and math, and um, this is going to be a total disaster, and you're going to have to support her for the rest of your life. Like, I, I mean, this was the conversation, right? I still tease him about that. But, um, but the thing is, I, one thing that I did was not listen to people around me who said, uh, you know, this is the only thing you're good at. This is the, right, the only thing that you can do, and so on. And um, and I wasn't sure, frankly, that I'd be any good either, you know, at trying to start up this bookstore 
or um, in law, and I sure as hell didn't know if I was going to be good at intelligence. And I, in each of these scenarios, um, uh, I took a leap of faith, essentially, that um, that I really would do my best learning about this next you know, possibility. And if I hated it, I could change again. And I think that helps, honestly. I, the, um, when going from science to the bookstore, I loved science. I loved math. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy it. Uh, but I decided that I wanted more. And I found it was very hard to do anything else other than science and math, frankly, when I was working on that. And so I thought this was an opportunity for me to see. And I could take a leave of absence from graduate school. And I could try it. And I did it. And I ended up enjoying it. And I found something that I found even greater passion about. And, uh, and I think if you have passion about what the next thing is for you, and it excites you when you talk to people about it, um, it's one of the most important things. And then the, the second one is just in every single one of these scenarios, you know, and the older you get, the harder this becomes, I find, you just swallow your pride a lot, right? Because you're suddenly, you know, you were an expert at something else, and now you just don't know anything, right? And so, you know, you're relying on other people to help you learn. And, uh, and I just had a, a tremendous number of people in my life over each of these shifts who were willing to help me. And, uh, and you, had, you had mentioned before that when you went to the, going to the CIA, though, you were the one who was fighting against it, and other people yeah. had to talk you into it. Yeah. I thought that was a terrible idea. I did, I, not, not even for me personally. I mean, I just thought, I'm not qualified for this job. I thought, this really doesn't make sense. And I had been nominated to be the legal advisor at the State Department at the time, and the president actually withdrew my nomination and had to re, you know, had to appoint me then at the CIA, and um, and the conversations were were just ones where I don't, I, I've never worked in the intelligence community before. Why on earth do you think it makes sense for me to do this? And and as the deputy, your role is basically you're managing <coughs> operations, you're managing the building, you're managing the the enterprise, and uh, and then you also spend a lot of time at the White House doing deputies meetings and presenting essentially the agency's case. Um, in the interagency, and it's, uh, you know, and so I just, I was very worried that it wasn't going to be the right shift for me, and, um, and that I wouldn't do a good job, and I wanted to do a good job, you know, for president, and, uh, and really what it came down to was that um, my predecessor actually was the one who convinced me. He'd had 33 years in the agency, and, uh, and he went, we had coffee, and, um, and he said, look, uh, historically, you know, the director of the agency comes from outside of the CIA, and uh, we have an unusual situation. John Brennan is a career CIA officer, and I think, as a career CIA officer, it's really important to have somebody who's actually seen the outside and is coming in with fresh eyes to be there in the leadership position to kind of, you know, to push back against kind of conventional wisdom, the way things operate, doing things differently, and so on. And you can bring value by virtue of your relationships in the interagency and your knowledge of how things work, because you can make the agency more effective in that interagency world. And the reality is, more and more today, we have to work together among agencies in order to be effective in our policy. So it was very interesting. But it's, it's a leap of faith, and I'm, it's um, rely on other people. You know, Don't be afraid to, to get help, is my view of what really helps. Rely on other people, but don't believe your dad. There you go. I know. <laughs> Um, one more question. Um, I guess I'll let the mic. I, I, let's go for the back row. I mean, you know, back row. You gotta. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Greg. I uh, spent time in the government in the, in the U.S. U.S. Coast Guard as an aviator back in the '70s. Uh, Steve, you, you mentioned that you thought the government had done a good job innovating in enclaves in the past. I mean, that's und undoubtedly true. You talk about DARPA. Office of Naval Research, NASA, whatever. Who's the better innovator today? Is it the government because those enclaves still exist? Or is it private industry? And how effectively are, because I know the government has a huge appetite for innovation coming from the private sector. How is that working? So, so one of the interesting things that uh, actually was, uh, I, I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but uh, going back inside and, and, and looking around, uh, some of these agencies. It used to be in the 20th century, um, US Department of Defense and Intelligence <coughs> Agency owned tools and technologies that were unique to us. 
No one else had drones. No one else had crypto. Uh, no one else had, you know, nuclear weapons. There, I mean, three other countries or whatever. Uh, it, it turns out that nowadays, uh, I'd say about 80% of what we used to own, you could order on Amazon and get delivered in 24 hours. It's a big idea. It's truly a big idea. Is that things that used to be available only to the DOD and Intel community are commercially available not only to nation states, but more importantly, non-nation state actors. If you've just read the news, you know, I, uh, ISIS was using uh, phantom, DFI, uh, phantom drones to drop hand grenades uh, with GF, uh, GPS location, <coughs> boom, on, on Iraqi soldiers. Ordered them right off the net. Because it's um, sort of, the, there's this broader thing where, like, through the 90s, you basically had better technology at the office than you did at yes. home. And at so, some so, point around 2000, that flipped. And this so, is like the So I want to go back to answer the question, though. So, so here's what's hard for government agencies, particularly ones that have secure enclaves, is now what they need to do is not only innovate internally, which they obviously do, they need to, how to <coughs> figure out how to partner externally. But gee, there's now this classification security wall is how do I set up you know, gee, do I shadow my secure system in an unclassified component? And, and they're all trying to figure out how to do this. It's not that, you know, this is a new idea. And so it's a different model than it was in the 20th century is now, how do you integrate external innovation inside this, in, people who are still innovating internally, but you have these security barriers and process barriers and, and gee, does, does a startup actually want to sell or work with the government? And gee, now you've got to convince them that there's a value in having dual-use technologies. The government would be the first customer. But no, the government still has a 400-page RFP that you have to fill out. Uh, and so the government needs to learn how to work with startups. We're, that's happening. It's not happening fast enough. And everybody will tell you it needs to happen faster, and everybody kind of gets it. I mean, you're the domain expert here. And so I'm trying to answer your question to well, say the world's kind of changed in a very different way is that it's not like we weren't being smart internally, but, but innovation is happening externally even faster. That would be my, do you think? Yeah, no, I, to lend credibility that the-, the um, Good, I need some credibility. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the intelligence community does this trends report uh, that looks out over next couple of decades, and um, in the last two of them, there have been sort of three trends that go to this point, I think, um, and, and highlight it to some extent. One is individual empowerment, you know, which is to say, you know, how easy it is basically to accumulate technology that allows you to do things that you couldn't do before in a sense. The uh, diffusion of power, which again is sort of another way of saying that, but that also replies to um, the fact that we're no longer in a kind of a Cold War struggle and there's a number of states that are um, becoming more powerful in a, a multipolar world, in a sense. And then um, uh, the rise of the non-state actor, in a sense. And, and when people talk about non-state actors, typically you think of terrorist groups. But in fact, uh, when the intelligence community is referring to it, they're also thinking about just um, essentially cabals of different actors that are not states. So it's like WikiLeaks. You know, it's it can be a group yeah. of multinational companies, right? right. That, that pull together in a variety of ways and, and that are capable of doing things that, frankly, states could have done. And they are among the spoilers, the greatest spoilers of government action now then, um, that make it harder to govern, in effect. But I think the cocktail hour is upon us. <laughs> Um, so you can, if people have questions, we'll be around. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.